uh, from University of Murray to Sri Lanka. I am going to introduce a stream-based JSON to XM by International Transformation Mechanism, which we can use to transform JSON to XML, uh, 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 and which solves some, some basic problem when we come to the this transformation, by directional transformation. Yes, uh, actually JSON no XML. It's a debatable question in industry which we, whether we need to use JSON no XML. There are many advantages in JSON and XML also, but uh, as you can see, it's some sort of bias. JSON going to win. Seems it's that. Seems JSON going to win. <laughs> Actually, why we need uh, JSON to XML transformation is uh, JSON has become very popular and useful for some use cases, uh, particularly in browser and mobi mobile client. Those uh, the developers required uh, require JSON to be trans deliver to and for, uh, from services where we often use XML as their back-end uh, back data models. So uh, we need some kind of mechanism to call to the back-end services where, uh, which uses XML, but we have, uh, we have, uh, when we have a client that runs in, uh, using JavaScript uh, or web browser, in web browser, some uh, sort of like that, uh, it appears there, there is a, an obvious and simple formatting, uh, uh, mapping formatting between the formats, uh, both formats, JSON and XML. It's, it's a uh, uh, data interchange, uh, uh, interchange uh, languages, markup languages, both are, uh, uh, JSON are lightweight, JSON lightweighted, where XML is well documented and well descriptive. So, uh, the, for in fact, there should be a simple, uh, reverseless, lo, lo, uh, reversible, lossless transformation. Which means, when uh, uh, so that given document in either JSON or XML, we transfer it to the other format and uh, uh, bang, we should end up with the identical, identical message. As uh, you see, uh, if we get the JSON message like that, then we need to transform it to the XML, which is. Uh, as you can see, ID is the attribute of the product. So uh, after that, uh, if if we how uh, however we if we can manage to transform that JSON to this XML, and we uh, if we need to transfer it back to the JSON, JSON format, how we figure it out? It's the ID. Uh, so uh, the value of ID is an integer, or whatever it is, and uh, the price is also a string in uh, XML format, but uh, the original JSON message, it is an integer, as JSON supports several message data, data, data types, numeric, string, null, boolean, but only XML has strings. There, there are so many existing solutions which uh, develop to resolve this problem. In JSON lib, they are using some sort of their own specific format to uh, convert JSON to XML. So they are using class object, which is referred to this is a JSON object, and the type string, which is uh, identify JSON, then uh, JSON is a string type, and the Boolean through is a Boolean type. So they are using their own specific format. So this is not generic generic way to convert, if we want uh, uh, generic way to convert JSON to XML. So we need uh, some sort of, uh, like this, this, type of, this type of message, instead of this type of several attributes, type, string, Boolean, so, so like that. In JTSON also use some uh, uh, bo uh, two conventions, Bezier Fisher convention and Mapped convention. Yeah, uh, JTSON what does is it get the JSON string and build up the build the stack uh, uh, using that string, and after that they uh, in inside it is write the XML string. So it's basically get the JSON string and build the stack and write it back to the XML string. Some kind of performance for performance issue is there. We get the input stream and read it and write it to the XML uh, as an XML string. So uh, the basic issue is how we, uh, in XM, JSON to XML transformation, how we identify it's a, whether it's attributes or it's an element. And the namespace. XML have concept called namespaces, but JSON doesn't support namespaces. Uh, and the other way around XML to JSON, with the, uh, the most applications, you identify whether it is a JSON object or JSON array. I, uh, seeing that there is a sibling, uh, sibling there is more than one sibling tags 
if, if you can see, uh, you can see that there is a two tags in one level. They then it identify there is a JSON array. But if 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 we get a one tag, it should be uh, when uh, if we if we transfer to the JSON, it should be a JSON array. So it it can't identify. So it basically what this is, it map to the JSON object. So the we end up with the non-identical JSON messages. Uh, this is approach uh, we are in, uh, we figure it out when I uh, when I do my GSET projects to uh, imp improve the JSON support in uh, of Apache Access to where uh, what we do is we use XML schema as we assume that every XML message ha uh, every XML message has uh, their own XML schema which describe the structure of the XML. So we use we we uh, in that assumption we use. XML schema to identify the XML structure of the message. There are so many details in the XML schema, but we only need few of them to identify whether it is a JSON object, it's a JSON array, it's a Boolean type, it's a numeric, or it's a string. So we uh, get, getting that XML schema, we build 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 a intermediate structure because uh, X, uh, normal XML schema is huge document. If we try to get it to the memory, it get uh, use a lot of memory in our ma our machines, so uh, we figure it out. Sorry, uh, we need to uh, uh, without loading whole schema into the memory. We build a, a lightweight structure. Where we what we need is is uh, the name of the element and the, is whether it's an attribute or not, uh, whether it's an array or not. Uh, the type of the value and the namespace URI. So we get these details and the XML, uh, the child list means if the, it is a complex type, that then there may, may be a child elements also. So we need to keep track of the, the structure of the XML using this uh, intermediate structure. How we, how we identify it, so whether it is array or not is, we look at this, uh, the max occur, uh, value. If it is a C, uh, if it is a C one, it is not an array. So if it is unbounded or more than one, it, it should be array. So we how, how, that's how we identify whether it's a JSON array or not. And the type you can see the uh, uh, schema defined a string int and uh, the object is stock is stock deck. So we 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 we, we can clearly identify it whether it is a boolean type or integer numeric type or a string type. So without, uh, at, uh, as Jerison also does this, uh, we, we come up with some sort of solution that we need, does not need to convert JSON to XML, actually, directly, we di did not, uh, don't want to convert JSON to XML. Instead, we wrap JSON input stream using XML stream reader. When, when the so back insights require the XML info set, then we read the JSON input stream and provide it to the back server without converting fully JSON input stream to the XML string. I will uh, explain how we uh, uh, we, uh, we build up that scenario. We are in this. Uh, if we get this JSON message, we are in this uh, start state where the the input stream is begin. begin. When uh, when uh, so back end service uh, call the next, then it read up to the that pi, uh, red, red 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 line. Come to that point and hold it. Because we need only the element name of the element, we provide it if we, when it asks. So like the likewise, we are traveling through the JSON string when it required. So uh, you can see that uh, we are not actually convert to the XML, but we are providing XML info set while reading the JSON input string. Uh, for the uh, as JSON uh, parser, we use JSON uh, Google JSON Stream API, and we we are providing XML reader and writer uh, Java standard API. Never convert JSON to X, uh, JSON to uh, JSON input stream to XML strings uh, directly. Uh, provide XML info set on fly while convert reading the JSON input stream under. We are uh, same as the JSON. We are using the stacks implementations where we put the put our uh, uh, to identify the structure of the XML, we put the uh, we, we we come up with the stack implementation, which uh, 
something like this in for the that message it's get filled up with the product and it's get, get, uh, put into the id and get uh, id back and get name then i uh, again get name back so and so forth this is the so how we convert xml to json the as i can say uh, as i can said uh, we use that maxoka value to identify whether it's a json array or object so we uh, using that we are when it's come right start element product we write it to the json output stream we are using uh, google stream api this is how it's work Uh, uh, I actually uh, did some performance tests with the ADB, which is uh, uh, which is we you know the good uh, high performance da data binding framework in industry. So uh, and, and access to their their own data binding framework, and we have good numbers with this extreme based XML, JSON to XML support. So uh, it actually we, uh, we were figuring out that it's because the size of the data traveling through the network or the the process given uh, process uh, happen in the side the json extreme so we need to do this some performance test more performance test to identify the the what are we, which area we uh, get in high performance uh, so actually this is a common scenario not only for access to it's apache camel also using json lib apache wink also using json so we can uh, use this implementation to improve the performance of those projects also. Yeah, thank you. Any problem? Any questions about this? Yeah. Actually, we can use content type, the content type header with the, the application JSON no. So the identifier it's. A, it's uh, when the JSON file is not well formed because uh, there, well, there is uh, an unknown tag or anything like this. How do you handle this kind of errors? Uh, uh, so actually, I, I think you're asking if it is uh, in here. You're asking whether we need to send the name yeah. as it is name in y the JSON isn't message. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are figuring, uh, we are using that na names to identify whether it's a uh, the ID or name. So as we, schema is available on, to everybody, the client also can use in that schema, build up the JSON string and send it through the wire. Access is on a way behind version of XML schema um, and other libraries. X XML schema is the big one uh, if you're using XML schema. And we also don't have dependencies on things like Axiom. Um, is that something that you're, yeah, yeah. Uh, is it things abstracted enough that that would actually work or? Actually, uh, we we'd have to re research some more. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. That's all the time we had for Shamir, everybody. But uh, <laughs> next we have Jeff Potts with one API to rule all content management systems.
Okay, hello, I'm Jeff. Um, I work for Alfresco and I'm on the um, Apache Chemistry uh, PMC. And um, today I wanna talk a little bit about CMIS, just to give you, who's already familiar with CMIS as a standard? So, if, <laughs> yeah, three or four people. Okay, so, so I'll just give a brief overview about what CMIS is and uh, what Apache Chemistry is, and then um, talk about a couple of things that are coming in um, CMIS 1.1 and then maybe we'll do a little bit of a demo. <clears throat> um, okay, so CMIS stands for uh, Content Management Interoperability Services, and it's a vendor independent API for working with content repositories like um, Alfresco, Documentum, Nuxio, uh, you know, rich uh, content repositories basically. Um, the spec, the SEMA spec is managed by Oasis and um, you can, um, the way that you talk to a SEMA server is through one of the bindings that's available and in SEMA's 1.0 there's a, uh, a web services binding and an Atom pub binding are the two choices that you have there. Uh, but SEMA's 1.1 has just um, been made a committee draft and it adds a, a third binding which is a browser binding which is based on JSON. So that's coming in, in, um, in 1.1. And then in addition to the bindings, there's a, um, a query language that's sort of SQL-like. So you can use um, uh, a common query language to uh, query for objects that are stored in these repositories, which is kind of a cool thing because um, prior to CMIS, uh, there, there was no standard way of, um, of interacting with Documentum, FileNet, uh, Alfresco, et cetera. Everyone had their own APIs and their own query language. So that's the, and my graphics aren't really showing up on this uh, screen, but that's the beauty of C CMIS is that, um, you know, most big enterprises today have at least two, three, sometimes more content repositories, SharePoint, Documentum, FileNet, et cetera. And so when you go in and you write an app on top of one of these repositories, a lot of times you're sort of, um, restricted in, in what kind of app you can write because there's a certain API that those repositories use. And so Seamus gives you a way to um, just use uh, rest, RESTful calls against these repositories and it's the same, same API um, across all the, all the different vendors. So you can use whatever framework or presentation, whatever presentation tier or pro programming language you want to use and uh, you can still get content into and out of uh, these repositories. So basically, you, you're going to write a client. It's going to do read writes against uh, the repository. And um, uh, CMIS is going to be sitting there on the client and um, often also on the server, mapping those calls back to the, um, back to the specific vendor. In CMIS, uh, the, the specification defines some um, domain objects. So um, these objects are things like documents, folders, relationships, policies, and type definitions. So um, if, if you've ever worked with a content management or a document management system before, then the concept of what a document and a folder is and things like that is uh, probably, um, you know, makes sense to you. Um, so, but the spec actually sets these um, forth formally and, de and defines exactly what those, uh, what those things are. Uh, there's a lot of different vendor support um, for, um, for CMIS. Now, Apache Chemistry is the um, reference implementation for, for CMIS. And um, Chemistry is an umbrella project for all of the CMIS-related um, projects that exist. So there's Open CMIS, which is by far the kind of most commonly used um, sub-project of Apache Chemistry. And it's the Java-based uh, client library as well as a server-side uh, set of libraries so that if you wanted to implement your own, um, if, you, if you had a repository that you had written and you wanted, to, um, you wanted it to be a CMIS server, you could use the, uh, the server-side classes um, to do that. Then there's CMIS lib, which is um, a Python client. That's what I maintain. Uh, then there's also a PHP client dot cmis, uh, which is a .NET client. And then recently we've um, added Objective CMIS, um, which is for iOS uh, clients. 
and Android open CMS. So for people that are doing mobile apps on top of Android, um, they can use CMS to, uh, to uh, get that content out to those mobile devices. Now there's some new stuff coming in um, 1.1 that's pretty cool. Uh, first is the browser binding, which I, um, I mentioned earlier. So the browser binding is JSON. Um, it's actually HTML forms going to the server and, and JSON coming back. Um, so this is nice because uh, the Atom Pub binding is uh, pretty verbose. So it's moving a lot of XML um, back and forth. So there should be some performance um, increases that we can get when we switch over to uh, use the browser binding. Um, incidentally, uh, a server, in order for it to be seamless compliant, has to be, um, has to implement all the bindings that are set forth by the spec. So um, that means uh, for a server to say that they're seamless compliant, they have to comply with or offer up both the web services binding and the Atom Pub binding. And then with 1.1, they'll also have to um, uh, offer a browser binding. So that means that the decision um, on which binding to use to connect to the server is completely up to you as a, as a developer. Uh, the next thing that's coming in 1.1, which I think is cool, is uh, support for aspects. Um, the spec calls these secondary types. Um, and uh, in, in Alfresco, we call those aspects, um, which is just a way of um, taking a collection of properties and sort of uh, dropping them onto an object. That collection of properties is called a secondary type. So uh, for a lot of people who uh, use CMIS to talk to Alfresco, um, secondary type support is, uh, is important. And as someone who works for Alfresco, I'm excited about that one. The next one is really cool is uh, type mutability. So today in CMS 1.0, uh, when you, um, you know, every type definition that's in the repository is, um, uh, has to be known by the repository beforehand. So CMS 1.0 has no way of knowing uh, how to create new types in the, in the repository, new type definitions. So now with uh, 1.1, uh, as a developer, you could actually, um, through the API, create brand new types. So this is nice because that means your, your end users who, if you write a solution that's based on CMIS, um, with 1.0, you'd have to give them um, a set of uh, uh, type definitions in whatever that native repository understood, and they'd have to go install that and configure that. And um, with 1.1, you should be able to um, inspect the repository see if the types that you need are there. And if they're not there, you should be able to create those new, uh, those new types through the API. Um, so that's type mutability. And then the next thing that's coming in 1.1 is called um, CMIS item. And um, a CMIS item is just a new, uh, a new uh, base level type, which is just uh, an object that doesn't have a file. So usually in a document management system, um, we're almost always talking about files. So there's an object, there's a file, and as a developer, when you ask for the object, um, you're gonna get the object back, and then if you want the content stream of that object, you just ask for the content stream. Um, but a lot of times, uh, you need a way of just uh, keeping track of arbitrary objects in the repository um, that may not necessarily uh, be associated with a binary file. And so that's where CMS item comes in. There are a couple other things that are new in 1.1, but um, these, are, these are the top items probably uh, coming in 1.1. So again, 1.1 is in um, committee draft, I think is the official status of that in, at Oasis. And um, we're just now in, a, in Apache chemistry starting to get some of these features um, into the build. So um, if you, let me flip over to, um, the CMIS workbench. So if you're doing anything, let me uh, see if I can make this easier to look at. Um, if you're doing anything with CMIS, it might make sense for you to, um, to start playing around with it by using the open CMIS workbench. And um, that's what I'm running here. And let me just start from a connection here. So uh, I'm going to connect to the, uh, to the server. I have two CMIS servers running on my laptop right now. I have um, Alfresco, 
and I have um, the open CMIS in memory um, ser CMIS server, which is really there just for development purposes. And so just to show you how this works, um, all you need to know in order to connect to uh, a CMIS server is its endpoint URL, and then everything from there uh, the client figures out. So for chemistry, the Atom Pub endpoint is um, whatever your web app context is slash Atom. So I'm going to uh, select my Atom Pub binding here and uh, load the repositories. So a given server may have one or more uh, repositories. So I will uh, load up this repository, and now I can. Now I'm sitting in the root of my repository. So a, a repository is like a, um, a hier hierarchical set of folders and objects. And, and so now I can click in this um, folder, and maybe I want to create an object. So I'll create an object, and let's put a document in this folder. Um, so let's see. Let's go find a uh, document real quick. Um, so we'll put this full sale brewery screenshot in here and hit create document. Now the document is sitting in a folder called CMSLib, and if I look at the properties, I can I can see all the properties of that object. And in this case, um, the workbench is using Tika to um, extract some um, the metadata off. This happens to be a JPEG, so it extracted some metadata off of off of that and. Uh, and stored it on the object here. Is there a reason to think it's an audio file? Oh uh, yeah, it's because I was I missed the drop down when I uh, when I created it. So the default is audio file. <laughs> so that's a type that. So you know when you create a type, you can select any type you want to. So I could have told it that was an email document. It would have still worked. Um, so um, yep. So good catch. Uh, so that's the workbench. Now, um, using this exact same set of APIs, I could um, connect to any server that is seamless compliant. That's the whole point, right? So if I, um, if I change my URL and point to Alfresco instead of um, chemistry's in memory server, I can load the repositories here. And now I'm looking at um, a, a, a repository from a completely different vendor, and, um, and I'm browsing that repository. Now, people that have, are used to working with relational databases are like, wow, big deal. You know, we've been able to do that for 25 years. But, um, but in the world of enterprise content management, this is a big deal. One, you know, now we're going to see an explosion uh, of tools that are going to spring up and um, all around, you know, helping you work with content in these repositories through this API. So uh, anyway, check it out, chemistry, uh, Apache chemistry, and... Um, I guess I have one minute maybe for uh, for a question, maybe two minutes. Yeah. Okay. Any any have anyone have questions about chemistry? Uh, I mean, yeah. Other than the obvious of you know patches accepted, um, why not uh, more of a file explorer like interface? Uh, yeah. So um, you could totally build that. There's no re there's no reason why you couldn't build that. And um, that's but that's uh, I mean this is. This is file, you know, folders and files. You know, this workbench here is just one sample uh, UI for working with stuff in a repository. But yeah, you could, um, you could do uh, integration like that. And then, given that, is it um, would it be uh, perhaps unfair to characterize it this way? But is it kind of like web dev with additional metadata? Yeah, yeah, that's not, that's not a bad way to characterize it. It's also similar um, in concept to JCR, uh, is another. Uh, sort of roughly analogous concept. Uh, on the, the aspects you meant, yep. uh, is that in, in the same uh, area? Is that comparable to mixings in the DCR? Yeah, yeah, very similar. So an aspect is is similar in that. Um, so it, let's look at. Um, I don't have any examples in this uh, particular repository. I don't think, um, but. Um, let's take that image as an example that I, that I put in there earlier. It had a bunch of, um, or let's say there was a latitude longitude on the, um, on the image. So the, the fact that uh, the latitude longitude properties might be in an aspect that we might call geographic or something. And um, then um, any document that had latitude and longitude could have that aspect, could be geographic in nature. 
So you could go into an object and say, okay, you, you now get this set of properties that, are, that relates to being geographic, so you latitude, longitude. Such an aspect dynamic. Yeah, at any time. Yeah, and you can also remove the aspect as well. Okay, I think that's my time. So if you have any other questions, come find me later. Thanks. Can you get you to put your slides on this flash drive? All right, that seems to be working. Uh, I'm Matt Benson. I'm going to be talking about a new common sandbox component that has to do with uh, bike co weaving briefly. I'm, uh, well, all these things that take up more time than I can, than I probably need to use up to go through them. Anyway, we're talking about a new component that's under development. Uh, I'm one of the principal developers of it called the Weaver component in the sandbox for Java bike code post processing. Uh, what does Weaver provide? We provide as an SPI, Service Provider Interface, for the basic concept of a Weaver that says what kinds of, everything's annotation driven, what kinds of annotations on, on what types of elements it's interested in receiving information about, and then it gets invoked with the appropriate information. We have, a, it, what our code is invocable from a Java API, though it's really designed for the Maven plugin and the ant task that we provide. The motivation for this actually came from the single implementation that we currently provide or that we're, that's under development called the Privilizer. Uh, this was eventually abstracted out into a more broad bike code weaving framework more or less, but the original motivation had to do with Java security manager privileges. Uh, here's the naive version of some code that does something that requires some kind of privileges from the system, well, you know, some sort of security manager privilege, in this case, read a property. Uh, that's the naive version, but if you run that under a security manager without privileges enabled, you're going to encounter ex exceptions. So the next step you get from there is you add the awareness of the security manager so that you do privilege to whatever you're trying to accomplish, and you by wrapping this in a particular implementation of the privilege action in this case and passing it to access controller. The problem with this is that the, you know, the additional direction of method calls and the additional construction of objects, et cetera, is heavier than it needs to be in the case that you're running under an environment without the security manager enabled. So the next thing that people usually go to from that point is to do these runtime checks of whether there's a security manager enabled and either do the access controller version of the same code or drop out to the naive version of the code. Now we can see that our, we already have duplication of code here, and then when you multiply this by however many methods you're gonna be writing throughout your code base that do this same thing, you can see that that starts to get very cumbersome very quickly. So that's kind of the motivation of the idea of the Privilizer. There were, you know, we explored a few things. Obviously Java 6 brought us uh, annotation processing in the compiler. Uh, with the sort of, you know, driven by the compiler, that didn't seem to be adequate to the task. And what we ended up with was bytecode weaving. Uh, so here's the, the first concept that we had in the Privilizer Weaver uh, approach was that we would have private methods which do the, well, private methods is an implementation detail that's actually configurable, but it would be recommended that you use things that have a private access because you don't want to just provide public access to calling things that require system properties and invoke the access controller. But here's, here's the canonical example of how we would do something in you know, the basic approach to Privilizer. We would annotate a, a given method as being privileged. When we go through and post-process this, this actually expands out into our initial, our, our original method is then replaced with that conditional code and then it's implemented by a hidden method more or less, a generated private method and a generated private inner class in order to accomplish these things without, and again, that's what, it, that's what your work would look like as a developer, and this is what your, the equivalent of the code that your class would then represent. Now the problem with that, of course, is that if you have 
you know, if you want to get foo from 10 different classes, you've got to create that same private method in all of them by doing it that way. So the next, and of course, we get into that concept, your first reaction as a developer is to do this and say, okay, I'm gonna have a public utility class and I'm gonna call this and do all that code there, which of course is unsafe for the reasons we discussed. Now you've provided, you've attempted to provide a public method that invokes all these security checks and thereby voids any security, any va value that you get from specifying your security policy. I keep up with what time I've got here. Doing pretty good so far. So we came up with next, and when I say we, uh, a colleague of mine in the Apache community really came up with this basic idea, which is not that revolutionary, going back to the idea of having a utils class. But in this case, your utils class, again, is, is implemented naively with no awareness of the security manager. And you would annotate the calling class such that any calls to utils are privileged. That expands to, and this is pretty small, but the basic, it's, a, it's the same idea more or less, except for the way that we would then use that utility code is we would actually copy it into a local private method, which would be, <laughs> this would be the privileged version of that, which finally does the naive call. And again, then when you get into the copied in version, we've now replaced it with the security manager checks and the corresponding action. That's really the, uh, the end of that, but what, you know, what, we, what we decided was that by leaving this utils class here in this example completely naive, that leaves it as safe as it can be because any caller who is able to, to call that method obviously had the privileges to do so and, and, you don't, and you're not exposing anything additional in the process of doing that. So in the future, and actually this, this last bit with the blueprint privileges is what I've been working on this week as time permits and at the hackathon, et cetera. And this is almost complete. It, it works all except for recursively called methods. And as an implementation detail, this is using Java Assist, which isn't necessarily the most robust bytecode processing tool, but it does get the job done for the most part. Uh, when that's complete, in the future, we hope to release 1.0 and get this plugged into several of the Apache projects in the EE space. Uh, we entertain ideas for new Weaver implementations. It's you know, a curiosity of what we could do with weaving bytecode at runtime. And of course, any contributions any of you or anyone else care to make. So we can be reached at the dev list at Commons. And that's the location of the code for which Hopefully that'll be available by the slides after the conference if anyone becomes interested. And I guess that's, I've pretty much blazed through that one, which is probably good because we were running a little behind, but if anybody has any questions or comments or. Cool. That's a good one. Thank you. Unfortunately, yeah, I could introduce the next person. Well, now we're a few minutes ahead, so we don't have to be so whatever. But uh, next, we will have Matt Franklin with something interesting about Rave. <laughs> that was just because I couldn't find the form. Uh, <laughs> Nick, Nick, <laughs> that, that's Nick filling it in for me. Did they ever have a Mac? Uh, we did at the conference. Yeah. Yeah, you know, well, that's a, <laughs> ho hopefully by the end of it, it's not still big. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit, I don't have slides, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, a couple of projects that we, that I work on, how they work together, and a couple of specs. Um, so as Nick put in the intro, something interesting about Rave, so one of the projects I'm gonna talk about is Apache Rave. That microphone. All right. So, who has heard of Apache Rave before? Doesn't count if you're a committer. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, <coughs> Apache Rave, in a in a nutshell, 
is a widget-based um, kind of user experience platform, or WebVid Social Mashup Engine is what we really call it. And what that means, let's see if I can actually make this fit, is if you've ever done anything with web widgets, so open social gadgets, or W3C widgets, or anything else like that, Ray's job is to manage those on a page for their users. So in this case, I'm, you're looking at the portal view. You can have other views like a you know, user profile view. We use it internally for a lot of, uh, sweet, thanks. We use it internally for a lot of uh, kind of planning dashboards. So if you can think of a big central map and then some widgets around the outside, and you can use the, the PubSub intergadget communication to be able to, to click on an item in the map and have the various widgets change context around it. So if you wanted to find out where Nick is and click on that and find out what Nick's cell phone bill was last month and all of the, <laughs> the other things, you could do that, right? Um, so that's what we use it for internally. We also use it for our phone book, which is what this is. It's this kind of view, right? So it's, instead of seeing a bunch of widgets that look like they can be moved around, it's about having a modular uh, application that's delivered to the users um, where you can do kind of client-side integration. Each one of these widgets hits a back-end data service that is its own. It uses the open social proxy to get at those, those REST endpoints. Um, Rave doesn't do anything with that. All it does is put the widgets on the page. So that's Rave. Um, really quickly, there's plenty more to talk about, but that's the, the short version since we don't have a ton of time. Uh, what I really wanted to talk about is how, where we're kind of taking Rave and what, how it's going to interact with some of the other projects that we deal with, like active, the Apache Streams. So Apache Streams is a new project uh, that we have started to build a new high performance uh, activity processor. So if you've ever heard of the activity streams format from this website, <coughs> activity streams is a specification and it's really just a data format for pushing around event based, social event based data. Come on, scroll. It's a, you know, so it, very simple format, right? You can have a bunch of different fields when it was published, the actor, so the, you know, the thing that's actually creating the activity, um, the object that it's being done against, a verb that is, you know, some action against that, that object, and a target, so some context that that, that operates inside of. So very simple format. Um, what we're building Apache Streams is to do is to allow a bunch of different publishers of activities. So inside of an enterprise IT environment, you can imagine all of the different activities that you see across the enterprise. So SharePoint has its own activity streams, uh, stream implementation. Jira has its own activity stream implementation. Wouldn't it be really cool if you could just you know, publish those activities out to a common, a common processor and then have them delivered to the users inside of their, their single context without having to go into 20 different applications. So that's kind of the, the model. And um, <clears throat> when you scale that out to the internet, which is one of the cases that a couple people in the project have, where they want to suck in like Twitter and Facebook and Pinterest, and then put them all together and then re-expose them to the users. They're, they're, they're similar problems, but they're scaled very differently. <laughs> so we'll see how, we'll see what the, hopefully we're building a flexible architecture that can su support both, but we'll see. But Stream's, Stream's job is to, to take in the you know, data in this format and then be able to do intelligent things on it, like security trim, um, aggregate, so if everybody in this half of the room comments on a blog post, Nick doesn't want to get 15 different or you know, seven different um, activity entries in his stream. It just floods them. Because if you do that from 20 different applications, 40 different applications, it starts to kind of really be a pain for the users and they stop paying attention. What you really want to do is say, they all commented on the same blog post, so Nick gets one activity entry about that. And when a new comment happens, it just pops up to the back to the top of the stack and says, there's one more. Then he can go look and engage in it. So that's the kind of thing that streams should support if we, if we can do it right in the end. We're pretty early on that project. But aside from the fact of being able to deliver you know, those activities to the user, why would you want to do this? Um, it's fun to have all this aggregated information, but not too many people are using portals anymore, right? the traditional portal sense. Well, we're, that's where open social comes in and allows us to deliver functionality through that stream. Right? So instead of just an activity stream, I can now say, as the producer of the activity, not just the, or the processor, or anywhere along the, along the line, I can now say, 
not only show the user this activity, also add this gadget to the context and let them interact with that activity and other services however I want. So that's the, the kind of that next step of giving an in-context ability to access your, your stream-based information. So you can see it's pretty easy, right? So I, um, anybody who's done anything with open social in the past knows that Shindig or any other open social container really just references gadgets by URL. Um, and inside that, at that URL is an XML file that defines all the resources and APIs that you require. With some container hints and then a context object that gets passed to it, the gadget's able to, to this, this context object will be passed to the gadget at runtime. And it will be able to go and say, hey, you know, give me my context and then go do things. So what that means is something like Rave that's able to, you know, Rave has an activity streams endpoint through Shindig. Um, but, uh, come on, internet, don't do this. All right. Better. <laughs> so the, the hotel Wi-Fi was so bad, I put it on my phone. And then I put my phone in my pocket, and the cell signal died. So helps if I put it up. All right, so, so right now we have no activities on this page, right? And we, got, we wrote a small little Node.js app that's gonna do some publishing of activities for us. So oh, start the EE demo. So in a few seconds, if everything still works from five minutes ago, it's never a guarantee, um, what you should see is an activity just popped in, right? So Canonical user posted a photo at his you know, photo album. It's Boston as seen from the Charles River. Um, and then, you know, a couple seconds later, he puts in a, a video, right? So normally, that's what you'd see in activity stream. So somebody like Twitter would say, okay, hey, I know that that link's a video. I'm going to go look at that, that link and find out that it's a video, and then I'm going to, you know, open a player, and I've got all this complicated logic inside of my, my client to, to do that. Well, what embedded experiences let you do is, you know, that's a generic stream bait or activity stream processor. This, you know, that you can take this gadget now. It's open up on, uh, on Open Social's GitHub. Take that gadget, put it in any context, and as long as you're feeding it actual activity stream data in that format, it'll be able to render it. No special things required. But the great thing is this embedded experience. So if I want to add it, you know, <coughs> that embedded experience that you saw before, and internet, come on, internet. This is what I get for relying on, on remote resources. Does it? Maybe I'll switch it over. What's that? All right, here we go, all right, there we go. So I just clicked add a comment, and what you get is a new gadget opened inside of the same, the context of Rave. So there's a whole bunch of APIs that are accessible to the widgets that allow you to launch additional gadgets. So it's part of the open social specification. Rave doesn't know anything about the gadget that it's rendering other than it's, it's an authorized gadget to be launched. Right? We don't just let you launch arbitrary code, that, that would be very bad. Um, there is some level of human in the loop. So I can sit here and comment on it and say, you know, Boston is cold. Which every year that seems to be getting less and less true. Um, and then, so great, so that, you know, what, what did that do for the user? It meant that the user was able to, to interact with, with something that was happening in a different application, the photo album at that point, um, and not ever have to leave his own context. So that's pretty cool. Now you can do the same thing with the, the video, right? So here's a YouTube video. I can play the video, I can comment on it, and I can close it out, and great. And I had no, no intelligence in the container whatsoever other than to know that I have a gadget that I'm gonna render. There was no video, you know, hey, this is a video, take it, pull it, and play it. So it lets you kind of really push on you know, through that. So if you're a business person, what if you wanted to be able to, to do something other than you know, comment on videos of cats or you know, something else, right? You wanna be able to do something real with this. So that's where, where if you can see this embedded experience model and, and see for what it is and see how you can apply it, you can start to see that you can really change the user's work workflow so that they can do stuff in context. Say I've got a project leader dashboard and your project leaders, I don't know, it, <laughs> my company project leaders have to approve travel and time. Um, so if your project leader is sitting there, his project leader dashboard, he doesn't want to have to leave. He's also you know, filling out his you know, quarterly uh, reports for how well the project's going. Instead of making him go off to a different 
different interface to actually approve time cards. Why, why can't he just do it right here? Right? You know, he sees that an activity came through that Jane Doe submitted her, her time card. You know, he, she, he wants to look at it. Okay, great. So here's the time card. I'm going to approve it. Done. So it's now long. You know, that was a 20 second interruption out of my way. Right? And then John, the same thing came through. He's terrible. You suck at time, which is better than he sucks at life. But, you know, so he sends it back, right? And it's done. So that's where the kind of power for business starts to come, is you can start to see that you can, you can interact with all of these, these different sources of activities. Um, and if you use CMIS, right, so you can reach back into your CMIS server for when documents get changed and start to actually show, hey, here's what Jeff's changes were, right? So if something publishes an activity for Jeff uploaded a new document, now your gadget can just show it, which <coughs> there is a CMIS gadget out there that can read the repository. Um, nothing authenticated at the moment. So that's kind of the, you know, what we kind of think is the next social business move. It's not about, you know, necessarily who you're connected to or who you follow or things like that. Um, some of these things are just natural relationships that you have inside your organization. Organization, you know, so like uh, <coughs> reporting organizations, projects, things like that, naturally group people. Um, you can have following models and things like that to, to augment it, but really you can start to push a social interaction that, that allows you to, to get some functionality in what we call in context, or as Open Social is actually calling uh, apps at the point of need. I'm not sure that actually makes sense, but so that's a that's a couple different projects, right? And a couple of different specifications. That's Apache Rave, Apache Streams, um, and Activity Streams the format. So if you want any want to take a look at what people are doing with activity streams, go to that URL right there. Open social, always of interest. Rave and streams. So that was, any questions? Yeah, I think I got like a couple minutes left. No questions. I do, um, the part you're working on is Rave and your and activity streams is the format, you're kind of adding functionality there? Yep. Right, so um, Rave, right now what this is, is so the Rave Shindig adapter has an adapter for activities. Um, so I work on Rave, I also work on Apache Streams, and I also work at Open Social. The only one I'm not on is, is Activity Streams, and I didn't you know, have the whole set, but um, <laughs> there, it's, there's a large overlap in a lot of these communities because everybody's right. trying to do the same stuff. Um, but in this case, the you know Rave is the thing that allows you to have the gadgets laid out wherever you want, right? So I can also, you know, you get your ooh, drag and drop type stuff, which nobody seems to care about anymore. Um, right, you could, you, you could if you wanted to. That, the point that we're trying to move Rave to is where you can, it's a flexible widget management framework. It really doesn't matter how you want it deployed. Do you want to deploy it as a portal? Great. Do you want to deploy it as uh, you know, a com composite application, more like our, our phone book? Great. The point is that you have these, these, each of these gadgets, especially with open social, there's a, a runtime HTTP proxy that lets you get back to, to other stuff on the network, right? So you don't actually, your AJAX calls aren't bound by, you know, cross-domain issues, and you don't have to worry about chorus headers or anything like that. You can just, you, know, you hit the proxy. That proxy can also do OAuth authentication, right? So it's an OAuth proxy as well. So now you can get authenticated access to services as well. So that's, that's where the, you know, kind of like a client-side integration model starts to come together. Any other questions? I'll get out of the way. Yeah, exactly, right, you know? <laughs> okay. right. No, sorry, I don't think anybody else has any questions for me, so I can.
<laughs> oh. Sorry, I was here. Yeah, hold on. Do you, would you rather... Uh, if you got to talk, that's okay. I can go after it. Whatever. It, it doesn't matter the order to me either. I, unless... Okay. Was it... No, you're all set up. Okay, it's a... No <laughs> I'm over here. I'm over here. <laughs> we have to figure out a live tweeting. Like... <laughs> Hash Brian, please come to the front. <laughs> I see how the pole got in the way. Uh, you can be the closer. Just need that uh, and battery, which is crap. Coming, I promise. Okay. That one never makes it. Okay. Should be open one more second. Oh, there we are. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, slow. <laughs> there we go. All right, this is my friend Chris, who um, also happens to be the Media Goblin founder. Um, so uh, he had this idea that it would be really fun to make a decentralized media hosting. Um, so he uh, is a longtime free software activist and coming from the Creative Commons community, he also does a lot of artwork and um, in particular a lot of 3D animation artwork that um, he likes to work on collaboratively with folks. So he was like, oh, I'd really like a format for hosting and sharing media that did a better job of supporting collaboration and, and also supporting control as far as the way that you share. If I skip over or use weird acronyms, feel free to interrupt and I will go back and uh, explain. Um, so um, he's on this service, Identica. Um, does anyone in here use Identica? Awesome. OK, one person. Oh, a little bit. OK, so it's kind of like the free software Twitter, right? Um, and uh, it's built on top of code called StatusNet. And it's, uh, it's AGPL software, which I realize makes it a weird one for this conference. Um, and uh, it, he's built a bunch of different things there. I know, I know you can troll me later. Um, and uh, anyway, so StatusNet is great. It's microblogging. Um, it, uh, you know, like you were talking about with the activity streams, like we've been looking at some of those different kinds of things. OAuth is definitely already in the StatusNet code. Um, but serving up 140 characters of like OMG cats like at a time is one thing and threading all of those conversations uh, is, you know, not easy but uh, a, kind of a finite problem. So what we decided to do was uh, to get some folks together and do this for media hosting. So we're like, hey, if you can do that with tweets, then why not with video and photos and everything else? Um, this is Jeff and your. Um, Jeff makes all the things look pretty, which was really important to us. We wanted, uh, hey, artists, come use this site. It looks like, but, but no. We were like, Jeff, help us make it look nice. So he helps us make it look nice. Um, different haircut there. Uh, and so uh, we started looking at, like, how do we do this? So email is kind of the classic decentralized service. Like, you don't care if your parents are still using AOL mail. Um, they don't care that you have your own domain. All of the email just goes back and forth. It talks to each other. It's fantastic. Everyone, you can have as leaky and crummy email as you want, and you can still talk to your friends who have, like, their own server, and it's, it's great. So, People choose how they share, they choose the format that they want to do their things in. So we know that decentralized services, there is a model there for everyone using their own thing but communicating through a common protocol. 
Um, so this is what I would think of as a healthy example of the internet in a many-to-many many, many many situation where um, all the nodes kind of talk to each other interactively, but there's no like one giant, like too big to fail thing at the middle like this situation. So um, for a lot of our existing web services where we host photos or we host videos, we have like one massive thing in the middle and then we're all here on the outside. So something happened to the middle or they decided they didn't like you on your little end of the node, then poof, you're gone. You're no longer connected to the everyone, not just the people you irritated or whatever. So that's not good. Um, so censorship on the internet uh, is perceived as damage and needs to be routed around. So in a decentralized system, like one place breaks down in the internet and then you can route around it and everybody's still all back and forth like, you know, happy, happy. So um, because we're giant nerds, we built support for ASCII art first. Um, because, you know, it seemed really important. Uh, well, but also doable. So we wanted to, like, kind of talk about, like, how will we model this sort of adding a media hosting type to, like, our existing framework? So um, we started with ASCII art, which was fun. And now we have a lot of funny GNU ASCII art on our website. Um, we added photos next. Um, our contributor community is pretty tight-knit. We have like pictures of each other's weddings, pictures of each other's cats, pictures of each other's babies that have been like used in testing and all these things. So it makes everybody like, oh, I've seen your infant. Like, I can't be mean to you on IRC. Um, and so uh, we, have, we have photos, we have videos now, uh, we have audio. Um, and then uh, when we got to that point, we were like, it would be awesome to get paid for this. So uh, we did a fundraising campaign. We ended up hiring our lead technical person. I'm a giant fan of paying coders and contributors. Hackers definitely got to eat. I know the free software thing thinks, might, you might feel like, hmm, she must not like money. I do. I'm a fan. Um, so we ran a campaign through the Free Software Foundation. It's sort of like Kickstarter for us, but they uh, took the admin fees and it went back into a nonprofit. So we were happier with that. They also promoted it to their members who are the kind of folks who are like, ooh, you guys are building like a decentralized media hosting project under the HEPL, I'm in. So it was a win-win. Um, we also attracted the attention of the Lulzbot folks. Do, do you guys know what the 3D printer, the Lulzbot is? Right? Okay. So, and then you know there's like two versions. Like this one has like, it's sort of an open hardware model where um, you can reprint other stuff and the pieces and bits are licensed freely. And then the other one is sort of like, uh, they uh, are trying to patent that. Or Intellectual Ventures has a patent out on it and, the, and they're trying to, everyone's trying to lock up their version of the 3D printer. But Lulzbot uh, was like, no, no, we're going to give everybody all the specs. Um, and in fact, they said, if you guys would build 3D modeling support, we will give whoever builds 3D modeling support for Media Goblin a 3D printer, which we were pretty jazzed about. Um, and in fact, Ava, one of our contributors, was the most jazzed. She has wanted a 3D printer like so bad for so long. She spent the whole weekend immediately after they announced they were giving one away coding up support. So now we're able to support 3D modeling, which is great for this. It's also like helps us with some of the back end stuff for Blender and you know sharing projects in that way. So it's it's very exciting. Um, so. This is sort of the pieces of the puzzle that we think would be necessary for like a good, like federated, decentralized media hosting. So some of these things, like the image support turned out to be not that difficult to build. Um, you know, audio support came in pretty quick. We have an API now. Um, you can put uh, geo stuff on your photos. And some of the other things turned out to be a little bit harder. Uh, this, the next thing we're focusing on, we have plugin support, is getting people to write plugins for different media types or plugins for porting it to different devices or, you know, we're, we're happy if you want to put our media goblin in your project or your project in our media goblin, like, we're, we're good either way. Um, federation, this is actually the hardest problem. So when you're talking about the activity streams, um, it's one thing to have like a, 
you know, like a finite group that you share with, but when you're like inviting the whole internet to the party, all of a sudden it becomes like a much bigger deal to figure out how to gracefully federate. And so our goal here is to have lots of different instances that talk over like a single protocol and you would seamlessly go from one to the other in the same way that you do email now. So you would be like, I'm on George's site looking at some videos and then I tool over to Mary's site and she has all these images and then like Julie's band has new sound up and I'm gonna go over there and you can comment you know, from your dashboard on all of those things without realizing like, you know, like Julie decided to change the database under the hood because she's crazy like that or whatever it is. So the federation is still the hard problem. And in fact, it's still kind of the same when you look at the thing that spawned the idea, status net, you still have this thing where it's like, wait, oh, and you want to go to another instance and it interrupts you to let you know you're going to another instance. And I'm not like calling Evan, the person who works on this project, out on that. He's aware that this is annoying. This actually might be his slide, I think. But um, so the goal is to have none of that like, hey, you're leaving one instance, going to another. It's like users aren't really into that. They, they like to just like, you know, giant back, black hole of like hours of internet without interruptions. So we want to give that to them. The other thing we want to give them is easier installs. Uh, right now it's kind of like two pages on the wiki. It involves like downloading a bunch of dependencies to run your instance. Plus like the idea of like you have your own server, right? You're just going to put it on your server. Not everyone really is ready to do that. So um, we're looking at a couple of ways to do that. Uh, for the folks who are like, yeah, I have my own server. Um, we've been looking at packaging it with uh, uh, distributions. We've been talking to Fedora and Debian so that people can just kind of like app get or yum and have a media goblin, like all the media goblin stuff sucked in if it doesn't actually ship with. Um, so easier installs are another thing that's um, going to be huge for us in the coming year on this project. So we're in your internet. We're decentralizing your medias. Uh, we are um, mediagoblin.org, pound media goblin on freenode.net. It's a Python project with a SQL database underneath, and if you enjoy the idea of pitching in on the hard project or hard problems of federation, we would love to see you. So, thanks. I'll take questions. I don't know how I did on time. That was like a five-minute talk the last time I gave it. So, yeah, um, Brian, right? Oh no, I just said okay for time. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> We see you. You're not invisible. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> I was going to ask, was it the babies or their pictures that were used in testing? Oh, oh, um, no actual babies, just virtual babies. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other level of like media type support. Um, maybe with the 3D printer, if someone wants to code up support for baby sharing. Um, <laughs> actually, I think you'd have to fork. I'm not really into baby sharing. I'm sorry. <laughs> did, did Ava get her printer? Yes, she did. And she started printing out stuff like we now like we have pictures of things it was printed out on the 3D printer. So, yeah, cool. Anything else? All right, great. Thanks a lot. Adapter's gone. Okay. Hang on a second. I got one. So Nick asked me at lunch if I could uh, give a quick talk. So uh, what I wanted to do, I just uh, had some ideas about things to share with the group. Uh, I don't know if you can read that. Probably not. Hold on. 
think you go Windows Plus. There you go. Um, so I work for uh, Microsoft Open Technologies, uh, which is a uh, wholly owned subsidiary of Microsoft, as we are required by the lawyers to say. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, what we do is work with the open source community, uh, engage the open source community, and encourage them to uh, help us make Windows Azure um, uh, more useful to the open source community. Uh, there's a lot of different packages on Azure. Uh, a lot of them are commercial packages. A lot of them are open source, um, as, I'll, as I'll show you today. Um, let's see, where do I want to begin here with? There we go. You got that? Okay. So um, I've been at Microsoft Open Technologies for a few months now. Uh, prior to that, I was at IBM and Deloitte and a few other places, some smaller companies, uh, uh, building uh, big data solutions, some proprietary, some open source. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I wanted to uh, plug my session for tomorrow. <laughs> uh, at 11 a.m., I'm giving a session on best practices for CouchDB for developers on Azure. Uh, and what I wanted to do in this session today is I'm going to give you some of the hints and tips that are more generic for developers. So you as a developer, as an administrator, what could you do with Windows Azure to make it useful for you? Uh, our group uh, has a blog, Interoperability at Microsoft. We are mainly concerned with standards, so we work with a lot of standards. We work with the Oasis community. We have uh, a few uh, Apache members and some VPs who uh, have joined. Uh, Ginugo Rabellino is one of our members, uh, uh, Ross Gardler as well. But uh, like I say, we have a group that's part of standards. We have a part that, that's evangelism and developer platforms as well. So what I want to show you today, how many people know about VM Depot? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody? Oh, good. OK. Uh, well, this is good to know. VM Depot is a website that we put together to create virtual machines. So on Windows Azure, you've got information, uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, along the lines of Amazon and other providers. Uh, but one of the things we were missing was a way to create and share virtual ma machine images, snapshots. So you can create, for example, uh, right now I'm working with someone to create a Cassandra image running on Linux. Uh, and uh, put that out on VM Depot. Uh, all the images on VM Depot, and there are quite a few here, uh, uh, I think there's about two or 300 now, are uh, mostly open source packages running on, and they all run on Linux. There's nothing in here that runs on Windows or anything like that. Uh, you can create them, there's no charge to create images, share images. You can brand them any way you want. We don't have any control over it. Um, we have a few basic rules that most people are going to follow in terms of uh, uh, content that has to be in those images and things like that or cannot be in those images. Uh, and uh, you can basically create them, share them. There's all kinds of information out here on how to do that. Uh, you create your own account. Um, let me give you an example here. So as I said, we're, we're um, working with a vendor right now to create a Cassandra image. Here's another image that we just recently put out there. A uh, Drupal image was put out by a business partner. Uh, they created an OData module that makes any Drupal, uh, everybody familiar with OData? It's just an easy way to access data from any data source using URLs and things like that. It's an OASIS standard. Um, and in this case, what uh, these guys did, let me show you the image, is they created, <coughs> there it is there, uh, they created a Drupal and OData image. So if you have a Drupal website out there, you can plug in a module and it instantly becomes an OData provider. So uh, right away you can do things like that. So the idea is you could take, for example, uh, I used the example of Cassandra earlier, you could take a Linux image, you could create a Cassandra uh, instance on that image, and then you could load something else on that image that you might have developed, 
or you might be wanting to share with a whole bunch of people. And you can put it out on VM Depot and say, hey, everybody, you can have a look at this. You can share it. And what happens is that image uh, is, is um, uh, built with a deployment script that you are able to use to put on Azure. Uh, one thing I should say about Windows Azure, I don't know if anybody's all that familiar about it, with it. Um, Windows Azure is, uh, uh, it has a free 90-day trial, and you're allowed right now up to 10 websites on Windows Azure. Anything could be on the websites for a year. Now, a year, they've been talking about that for a while, so it's probably going to be the rest of 2013. But it's all free to do this, so you can free, uh, get a free account, create images, share images, deploy images, try images out. Uh, one of the examples we were talking to uh, a few people about here is um, sometimes when you do a tutorial on a new platform, uh, the instructions on setting up the platform for the tutorial are you know, 10 times longer than the actual tutorial itself. Uh, so what you could do is you could set everything up on a Linux server exactly the way you want it. And then there's some easy steps. Uh, basically, so far, people who've never created an image before, it usually takes them three or four days to create the first image and uh, take a snapshot of that Linux server that you've created with all those components put together, put it out here, and then share it with the community. Everyone can download it and start working with that tutorial right away. So it's just a quick and easy way. And everyone gets 90 days free trial. And even after that, it's uh, uh, fairly affordable to, um, to use, for example, for a tutorial briefly to go in and it'll be uh, sort of coffee money sort of prices, not, not, uh, <laughs> not uh, night out on the town kind of money to uh, run that tutorial on your, your own account. So I wanted to give you an example here. Oh, uh, the other thing I want to show you, um, so that's VM Depot. So it's an easy way to create and share images. Uh, there's also uh, an easy way to create and, and uh, use websites. Uh, and I don't know if anybody's ever seen this. Um, so on Azure, you've got, for example, you can create a website from gallery. And we've got a bunch of pre-made pre -made websites. Yes? So if I understand correctly, the person that you're sharing the, uh, 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 the VVM image also, also has to be a subscriber to Windows Azure in order to run it. Is that right? They have to sign up for an account, yeah. Um, but yes, they, they do. It's a VHD image, and uh, it, we create a deployment script that goes and, and deploys that onto Windows, Windows Azure for you. But yes, everyone has to have a Windows Azure trial, uh, or a trial or full account to do that. Um, here's some of the packages that you can install fairly easily. Uh, and I know this, you know, uh, for the Apache crowd, this might not be as interesting, but uh, you can either create a base website, which is just a build, basically, or you can create one of these images for a website as well. So the reason why I want to show you this is, let's say you have a, um, a multi-tier application that you want to deploy on a cloud service somewhere. Uh, you can use VM Depot for the back end. You can create a Linux server. Uh, you can actually set up everything you need for that server, including connection strings and things like that. Then you can go over here and you can set up an easy website, and you can even use one of our, our pre-made configurations for that website, and use that as your middle tier for web browser applications. Uh, and I'm gonna show you a few tricks for, for hacking those as well. So these are easy to load. Uh, I should say about the VM Depot images, once you create an image, it becomes an infrastructure as, as a service image on Azure. Uh, you can get in via uh, Windows Remote Desktop, RDP, SSH, uh, uh, PuTTY, anything you want to get in uh, to that application with. It's basically your server, uh, so you can configure it. That's not the same flexibility you have with these websites. Uh, with the websites, there's some very specialized tricks you need to get into them. So I'll show you what those are. And so I won't make one right now, but it takes about five minutes to set up one of these. So if you want to set up a Drupal instance, it's literally sort of like a Fisher-Price Fisher sort of interface, you know, sort of the kids can do it. If your mom wants to set up a website, this is a great place to come and do it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so not a lot of knowledge needed for this. Now the trade-off is uh, you don't have a lot of flexibility on what that website looks like. But <clears throat> this example I want to show you, yes. Stay secure if someone who doesn't really understand it can set it up. 
Uh, well, that's, that's the thing. So it's pretty well sandboxed uh, so that the security is all built in, uh, login, Active Directory, you have to authenticate to get in here. But in general, you're building a website that then, you know, for example, if you created a Drupal website or WordPress or .NET Nuke or MediaWiki uh, website, you have to know a little bit about that security on that platform. But the only way to access it by default is through the web interface for that platform. So for WordPress, you set up your users through. You've got a MySQL backend for that. You need to know a little bit about MySQL, things like that. Um, one of the other interesting things, this deployment tab here, so you can create a website pre-configured that's not part of the gallery, but it's a GitHub website. And you can actually publish that. In this case, this, this website that we're looking at was published through GitHub. Uh, so you can actually publish directly to a Windows Azure website that way as well. So you have some control over setup and security and things like that uh, in advance. Let's see. So that's just an example. Uh, some of the things you can do as well to create those websites for GitHub uh, or other platforms, uh, you've got several different mobile, uh, uh, several different SDKs that you might not know about, Node.js. Node.js is actually one of the pre-made web gallery sites that you can build on Windows Azure as well. Uh, PHP, Java, Python, uh, Steve, he's not here. He was asking me about, uh, do we have a Python SDK for Azure? So let me back up a bit and just explain. So a lot of talk goes into the cloud and things like that, and people look at it like uh, hardware and operating systems. But what uh, Microsoft's trying to do here is really build a integrated development environment as well on top of that. So the idea is you have you know, sort of the world's biggest development server <laughs> that you can actually put things on. Uh, and that's why the SDKs uh, integrate so well. That's why we're doing things like integrating with GitHub and things that you wouldn't really expect Microsoft to do. Uh, you know, we'd usually go with, you know, you have to have Visual Studio, therefore, you know, to, to get onto our Azure platform, things like that. So we're trying to make this big development platform that you don't really need to worry about the back end. Oh, so you want to have replicas all over the world, you want to have clusters, you want to have a high availability sets. Those can all be configured behind the scenes using commands, working with a Chef and some other things, so ops code to build Chef recipes and cookbooks and things like that to help with deployment and setup. <clears throat> and you can really concentrate on building interesting apps. Uh, so that's the reason behind the SDKs, that's the reason behind uh, uh, VM Depot and some other things, yes? Oh, no, they can, yes, absolutely. In fact, you have to, most of the coding that you need to do is needs to be offline. Uh, oh, so then, so then you push it back up to Azure, and then Azure uh, manages the putting it in the correct Git repository for you? Um, I didn't want to understand the, what's awesome about the, that step. I okay, so you can create whatever, whatever you do now to build your applications and put them on GitHub. Uh, and the GitHub is just still your repository. But you can deploy from GitHub directly onto a website here. So just oh, one. deployment is the part. The, that's the yes. added. OK, I just wanted to make sure I was giving one. No, no, no problem, no problem. So you can create a deployment a distribution. Uh, you can actually put it on Azure, and Azure will know what to do with it. Uh, now, there's a few limitations I was saying about these websites. They're fairly well sandboxed. So security and things like that, there's not a lot you can do to run things. But I'll show you a few tricks that you can use behind the scenes to actually run some things. Uh, this website that I was showing you just a second ago is actually the website I'm going to show you tomorrow. It's a scheduling website. This is it. Uh, it has a CouchDB backend, and it has a website middle tier. And then we've got the browser for the front end. So it's a three-tier application that we deployed on, on Azure. Um, it's kind of interesting, but I don't want to go into that too much detail. I'll cover it tomorrow. But uh, it was all built by uh, us at MS Open Tech. We put together a Git repository. We deployed it. We distributed it to Azure. And uh, it knows what to do. One of the tricks is uh, you have to run Grunt.js. Does anybody know what Grunt.js is? It's a task manager. It's an open source JavaScript, server-side JavaScript tool. 
Um, so how do you get that started on a website when you're deploying it in Git? <laughs> you have to have some kind of command line. And uh, is anyone here familiar with Project Kudu? Which is, uh, okay. So out there on, on GitHub, what we've done is the web, as, as your distribution files are actually based on uh, Project Kudu. And I showed you the JDKs earlier. One of the things you can do, uh-oh, what did I just do? Hold on. There we go. I'm sorry, did I say JDKs? SDKs earlier. I've been working with Java all week, so uh, try to get ready for a EclipseCon in a month. Um, <laughs> so the SDKs are, um, this is a Windows Azure PowerShell, and there's also a cross-platform command line interface. If you download this cr cross-platform command line interface, which works on Macs, Linux, everything, uh, it actually allows you to have a command line interface into, uh, into the Azure websites and into the virtual machines, everything. So you can fire off scripts, you can run, uh, uh, for example, Grunt.js in the web app, blah, in the web uh, uh, gallery uh, tools that we have on the websites. Uh, now, how do you automatically get it to run? Well, there's some kudu scripts that you would actually put as part of your distribution in GitHub, and when you put that on your site, uh, Azure automatically deploys it, including the GitHub uh, uh, scripts, and allows it to automatically run Grunt.js. So it's a nice way to pre-configure tools for end users or anyone else who wants to use uh, some of your applications and your projects. So a uh, couple of different options there. Um, the web platform installer is another thing. So if you want to get really into distributing things on Azure, and this goes for any tool that you have, including Java, Python, anything like that. Uh, the web platform installer is something that Microsoft put together that allows you to actually automatically uh, create install routines that automatically push things to the cloud uh, from the command line, uh, not from a command line, from an exe or something on your local machine. Um, web matrix is a tool that you can use to uh, actually manage these files as well. It's a free tool out on the web. It only runs on Windows, though. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but basically, uh, you can actually manipulate files on your websites as well. And that's Web Matrix. So I showed you Project Kudu as well, and I've showed you the conference. Um, I think that's about it. So just to wrap up, so what I wanted to show you was some of the things we have. We have VM Depot. We're looking for people to create virtual machine images on VM Depot. If anyone is interested in doing that, please let me know. Uh, we can help you. We can help promote your images as well. Uh, and we can help distribute them and uh, it will get them built in the first place. So uh, also I wanted to show you the websites, how easy it is to create a website, and then how to manipulate it through the back end just real briefly. This is, I could probably go into this for hours and show you the different code and things like that. but. Uh, uh, for now, that's, that's what you need to know. Uh, some of the SDKs and the command line tools for, for getting things done in Azure, uh, the web platform installer, the web matrix, and uh, Project Kudu is what platform installer, the command line interface, and uh, a lot of tools in web matrix are based on. So if you want to get into the behind the scenes code, it's all open source and you can get that from GitHub as well. So. Few ways to sort of hack Azure, and like I say, you've got a 90-day free trial if anyone wants to try it. But it is a big platform for development, and it's kind of interesting. Yes. So all the VMs are Linux-based. Is there no uh, Microsoft? They're all Linux-based. Uh, yeah, we wanted to make sure that there was a facility for having these images to share on Azure. Uh, you know, Azure is taking a different approach than you might expect Microsoft to take, obviously. Uh, we are looking at open source, and uh, we are not just looking at open source, we're fully supporting open source, and we're behind the community as much as we can. That's why we're here, and OSCON, and DrupalCon, and all kinds of other uh, uh, projects as well, standard-based commercial products, anything we can put on there. And of course, you know, our interest in that is people are gonna run things, we're gonna have storage, we're gonna have activity that we, that we bill for. But uh, really, it's not, it's not a, a religious uh, issue at all in terms of <laughs> the uh, operating system or any of the tools that we put on there. No, I had a particular application of mine that I've used at uh, uh, Amazon for that simply that, uh, you know, I'm running a Mac here, but I'm trying to do cross-platform compatible development, so I actually mm -hmm. take Uh-huh. 
compatibility in our country. It looks like I won't be able to do that on Azure because you actually don't have a, a, a Windows AMI so that I can do that. Oh, uh, well, not in the VM Depot. But uh, I'm not sure about that. I think any infra infrastructure as a service uh, offering that we have, uh, when you create those, let me see here. Uh, I think we do. If you look at, for example, new uh, app services, virtual well, machine from gallery. Right, yeah, no, that would work. Uh, well, on the back end, you could use the infra infrastructure as a service, and then on the front end, the website. Uh, so these are some of the platform options that you have. Let me do this again. This magnifier tools kind of works. <laughs> there it is. Uh, so let's see, here's some of the options you have. You've got um, uh, these pre-configured virtual machine images that you can use as a base. So you've got Windows Server 2012. Uh, you know, if you're working in a... a operation right now that doesn't have Windows Server 2012, imagine that, uh, you could actually come out here and get a virtual machine to start testing things before you deploy and upgrade and things like that. Uh, so these are some of the, um, the pre-made platforms. We've got SQL Server, so SQL Server runs on Windows uh, 2012, and there's also some Linux ones, which I wish I could show you. Yeah, where are they? But, uh, oh, there we go, Suzy Linux, Ubuntu. So we have this concept of endorsed Linux, there are three, uh, CentOS, SUSE Linux, and Ubuntu. Those are the four, I'm sorry, the, the four, the three uh, endorsed Linux images that we provide support to, to third parties for. So you could actually create uh, out on the infrastructure as a service a um, Windows image or a Linux image. And uh, it'd probably be able to run the, the things you, you're looking to run. Any other questions? Okay. How does licensing work when you do spin up a Windows server? Do I just pay for time, or do I also have to pay for a Windows server license? Yeah, the Windows server is is uh, there's the license rolled into the time that you spend. Okay. Uh, you don't have to, and if you well, have, the license, I guess, for if you have through a agreement or some other way an on-premise license that you have for Windows server, depending on the version, you can use that on. Um, you can actually use that license on here and there won't be any additional charges for the license portion of that. Yeah. Other questions? No? Okay, well thanks. I hope that was useful. I, yeah. <laughs>